is up, guys? I'm Andres. This is RB3. And this is the Meaning of Podcast, the podcast where we talk about your favorite film directors and the deeper meaning within their films. We are doing not a film once again, and we are doing not a director once again, RB3. We yeah. are doing uh, an IP, a show, a movie, something that people have been uh, really interested in for years. Yeah. And and people love this. It's yeah. a graphic novel. It's a movie. It's a TV show recently on HBO. Yeah. And that is Watchmen. Mm-hmm. Um, again, something that a lot of people have a connection to, whether it's the graphic novel or the movie. And now the show recently that aired in uh, November and December of last year. Yeah. Uh, and the I was last to- weekend of October, I think, is when it started. Oh, last weekend of October. There you go. If I'm so, not mistaken. And I was texting you that the show was just... I, I wanted to do like a daily recap because I felt like every episode was just giving me something new and different right. and was giving me something to talk about. Mm-hmm. So uh, finally, we get to it and we're going to do a recap of pretty much everything. We're going to start with with our, our connection to Watchmen. Like, where does it begin? Uh, does it start with the movie? Some people started with the show, but a lot of people started with the graphic novel. Is, is that where you started, man? Um, not necessarily. I mean, it was kind of a converging path. So, I mean, the first... My first literal exposure to Watchmen was the first was the movie, um, but not necessarily the movie itself, but the trailer, the Smashing Pumpkins Comic Con trailer that came out, I think in J- July two thousand eight or two thousand nine or something like that, and um, and that to me that trailer was just the coolest thing ever, and I really didn't have a just from that trailer alone it kind of persuaded me to check out uh, the Watchmen graphic novel. This was during the time period where I was starting to just get into comic books mm. and. Um, I think I told you or somebody, uh, maybe you, but probably other people as well. The first comic book I ever re- read was uh, the Spider-Man comic book where Obama was like on the cover mm-hmm. or whatever. So then during that time period, I was like 2008 when that was published. So like 2008, 2009, I was like really starting to get into graphic novels. So I checked out Watchmen. And at the time, as a, like a kid, I didn't really understand it. Um, and I kind of had a hard time finishing it because it's such like a dense like piece of work. And that time I was like... 12 or 13 or something like that so then it really didn't connect but then the movie i watched the movie and it made it made the story of Watchmen a lot clearer because it is like a panel for panel adaptation but it it does in a lot more for lack of better terms mainstream type of way so then um through watching the movie a bunch of times and just being a Zack snyder fan in general because i also like Zack snyder a lot um i was able to get a better comprehensive understanding of the of the story of Watchmen came to love it even more. So then through that, I went back and reread the graphic novel and ended up falling completely in love with that even more because it's the same as the movie. The movie and the and the graphic novel are pretty much the exact same, um, except for a lot of major differences. <clears throat> but they, uh, but the heart of the story is the exact same. So, but the the graphic novel gives you so much more detail and so much more. That's much more spread out and. Um, non-linear and, and kind of structured in this really insane, kooky kind of way and it has a lot more operatic type of tone than a Zack Snyder movie does. That I just ended up growing to love that even more. So yeah. That's, it, some, that's my connection to watch. It, it's interesting because, I, I don't know, I, I've really, I we even talked about it before we went on, if, yeah. if we're for being real. I, I have a struggle with the whole idea of like, Every time someone walks out of a movie is like, the book is so much better. Oh, my God, the book is. I'm like, bro, it's a book. Yeah. Like you have a thousand pages. Right. This is a movie. It's supposed to be feature film length, like two hours, two and a half hours. Like, yeah, you're not going to get the kind of detail and the kind of character studies and in-depth character analysis that you're going to get inside a book or a graphic novel or or whatever the adaptation is. So that's why especially something like Watchmen, which was on the Times 100 uh, greatest novels of all time. Yeah. So it has a esteemed reputation. Well, that's why for me, I, I get so frustrated with people who are like, oh, the, the graphic novel, oh, bro, the book. And I'm just like, it's a graphic novel. It's a book. Like, yeah. my God, guys, let's, it, this is a different form of uh, not just entertainment, but a different form of content. It, it's, it's supposed to say a different thing in a visual aspect using sound, music, acting, all these kind of different avenues that's what film is that's what tv is so so that's why i kind of struggle with the whole idea of like this yeah. is so much better and i'm like yeah it's supposed to be better because you have yeah. more there there's more so yeah. well with i think Watchmen is a particular in- interesting case because it is like so similar like in terms of like taking the exact panels and the, the graphic novel and adapting that to the screen i think zack snyder literally used 
the, the comic book panels as the storyboards. Um, and then, um, obviously, Terry Gillian tried to adapt it. Yeah. Terry Gillian tried to adapt it in the 90s, but he thought the book was just too dense to make it into a two-hour movie. It had to be a six-hour miniseries. That was, that was kind of his proposition. So um, doing Watchmen, the movie, Snyder did a really good st- – job of streamlining the story like to like the perfect amount taking amount, taking away just the amount of right stuff from the graphic novel um the problem the problem with his adaptation i think is less from like taking away from the graphic novel but it seems like there's like a kind of a fundamental misunderstanding that's kind of happening between the movie and the graphic novel again they're very very similar like panel to panel wise or i guess scene to scene wise um but the the whole thing with the graphic novel is that it kind of promotes this idea of like anti-violence or like what's the consequences of violence and obviously Zack Snyder is not the one to give his characters consequences for violence right I mean he literally uh, and a lot of people who read the graphic novel uh, and didn't like the movie will say that the the characters in the comic book are heroes and are are heroes they're superheroes but they're humans but emphasis on the humans but in this in the Zack Snyder version, they're superhumans. Like, they're literally, like, breaking people's bones as they're, like, fighting. And the comedian's literally, like, falling through tables and, like, surviving and shit like that. So it's a little different in that sense. That's the kind of the main difference. But I do think, I do think if people want a comprehensive understanding of the graphic novel, they should watch the movie because it is, everything is there except for, like, major differences. So, so you're saying the novel kind of goes out of its way to say this is wrong, this, this, this glorification of violence, and then you give it to Zack Snyder who's glorifying violence yeah. while criticizing violence? Is that what he's doing? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's, I think the criticism that we see in the movie is inherent in the graphic novel. I mean, you can't really make the graphic novel into a movie without carrying over the, the deep sediments of, like, criticism of superheroes and morality and stuff like that because that's inherent in the material. It's just there's there's a lot of things. For example, the prison breakout scene where uh, Night Owl and Silk Spectre 2 break out Rorschach, in the graphic novel, that's just one single panel. But in the movie, it becomes a 10-minute fight scene, you know? The scene where uh, Silk Spectre 2 and also Night Owl are walking back from uh, Hollis Mason's house and the graphic novel is like kind of a peace, not like peaceful. That's not the right type of word, but they're they're fighting. They're 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 fighting those muggers. Is less of a thing of like let's just enact violence and rage just for the sake of it. It's more of like a meditative trip, um, reflecting on their on their superhero past, and it's intercut with shots of Doctor Manhattan just reflecting on his own past mm. too. So it, it, it presents itself a little bit differently. Yeah, it's interesting. I, yeah. I, I I tend to agree with you because that is probably a negative aspect of but the, the film. T- t- I'm not. That, I don't criticize Snyder's film for that. I mean, there, there oh, are there are aspects of it that are way more violent than it than it has to be. That's what um, I'm saying. Yeah, there that, are, that's kind of what I'm saying. Yeah. I thought that's what you were saying. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 exactly what it is. I mean, there are there is way more violence in the movie than there should be. There's a lot more dick in the movie than that's in the graphic novel. Sure, it's the whole point is you know. Zack Snyder's very, like, masculine kind of, some will argue, like, Aryan kind of dude who, like, likes to, like, put, or not Aryan, Iranian, you know, kind of dude, the guy, you know, Anne Rand, who's the, uh, who's the chick who, like, wrote all, like, the super misogynistic books, like, The Fountainhead and, like, all of that shit, Arkham's Foul. Anyway, um, the, we see, like, Zack Snyder's presentation of, like, masculinity, presenting itself super heavy in this in this movie, even down to the point where he gives Ozymandias these big giant pancake nipples like in his costume. But the but in the in the graphic novel it kind of subverts those elements. It goes more out of his way to kind of tone down the more overly masculine, overly hyper violent sexualization of violence in, 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 in the graphic novel. It's Interesting. Kind of, it's kind of against that. But Zack Snyder inherently as a filmmaker, he kind of embraces that. Which Makes it kind of a cool, interesting compare and contrast type thing. So, yeah. I, I yeah. think Zack Snyder is, is a G. I mean, we've talked about it. We did a whole Zack Snyder episode. Yeah. We're just, this is my favorite Zack Snyder there you go. too, by the way. There you yeah. go. Yeah. I mean, I think the guy is, I don't know, kind of, I, I think the guy's a G. I think he knows what he's doing. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting the way he does uh, the action sequences in this movie is kind of an interesting conversation. But I still feel like at its core, the criticisms that this movie 
is is trying to make are the same that the graphic novel is trying to make. Yeah. And yeah. and it comes to the same conclusion of of all these ideas that Alan Moore had in the original graphic novel, right. which is why I enjoy the movie and which is why I kind of become like a Zack Snyder defender mm. when a lot of people are rolling their eyes at me right. um, because I kind of go out of my way and say, actually, that's not true. Go watch Watchmen and you'll yeah. see a Zack Snyder that isn't like just an angry guy who's tossing people off cliffs and stabbing them like Leonidas in 300. Right, um, right, right, there's right. a lot more to him, I guess, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, 100%. But, but yeah, let, let's just uh, let's talk about the, uh, the connection, first of all, between we're, we're kind of on the same track. What, what was Alan Moore trying to say in the graphic novel? And do you think that was said in the movie, what I just said? What, what was the biggest theme in the Watchmen graphic novel? Yeah, I mean, they, that's because what, there's a lot. That's right? yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of the key question I think people are still trying to figure out 35 years later. Like, what is he trying to say? I mean, we know the things that he's against in this, you know, in this and through the text, right? And, and we can get that from other of his works to be fair. Yeah, to, yeah, absolutely. Cuz he's written a lot. Yeah, he's written a lot and he's obviously he's a lot more liberal leaning on the political spectrum. Um but which, he but he's he's like an anarchist. Right? Um, essentially, I mean, that's what that's what the perspective of Warshack is. It kind of fulfills that more anarchist yeah. kind of uh, sen- sen- um, sensibility that um, Alan Moore kind of has. Um, but you know, he. But in terms of the political value of the graphic novel Watchmen, it is a very left leaning, liber- liberal leaning kind of graphic novel. Even though Warshack is presented as this overly right ring especially in, in the movie too they portray it too he's, is that not how he is in the graphic novel uh, he is he is, he oh, is. Okay. he's, he's a very say. he's a very like he's a very much like uh you know prostitutes are littering the streets uh these whores like he's a very he's a very angry right ruling dude yeah through and through but the, the the book and the movie does a really good job of criticizing him for that i think the movie does kind of blurs the line a little bit because again the violence of it, it you are kind of like Worship hearing all the yeah. violence that he's committing in the, in the movie. Yeah. But the graphic novel for sure tells you this is not the right side morality to, to, to speak on. But his convictions of like the black and white kind of mentality contradicts like a lot of the other characters' um, values of morality and uh, what a hero, what the definition of a hero is supposed to mean, too. Yeah. Um, so, but, but it's interesting when you contrast him with someone like the comedian. Yeah, yeah. Who's like... But he's also super. He's literally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. literally in the movie, Ozymandias has a line where he's like, he's practically a Nazi. And I'm like, no, he's definitely a he Nazi. Definitely is. Yeah, <laughs> he is yeah, a Nazi. Yeah. <laughs> those two characters. The guy those... just likes killing anyone. Yeah, I mean, those two characters are unsympathetically, you know, are, like they're unforgivable. And and especially someone like the comedian who literally raised. But I, are you saying Rorschach? I, I would put Rorschach, like, I think Rorschach is even like, dude, you got to chill to the comedian. Yeah, uh, yeah, yes and no. I mean, the the movie softens Warshack a little bit more, okay. I think, than the graphic novel does. Um, and I don't necessarily think soften. The way that the graphic novel is kind of structured, it is framed in the same way of, like, Warshack's journal. You do follow, like, his journal a lot through the movie, or a lot through the graphic novel. Um, but, like, the the movie uses it as a more constru- concrete, like, sh- structuring device. It's like, this is the beginning, this is the end. Where in a graphic novel is so filled with so much other stuff, you kind of have a more objective kind of look, as opposed to the movie where it's literally his POV the entire time, which is a good way of adapting this, this, this graphic novel because the graphic novel in and of itself, and this is my favorite part about the graphic novel and the movie, it's a noir story when you get down to the heart of it. It's a mystery story, right? Like, a comedian dies, who killed him? That's the central question that runs throughout. And then Warshak is the character who's trying to figure out that, who's, tr- who's trying to put those pieces together. Um, but uh, just along the way, you're meeting all these different people. Um, so that's why I think is really, you know, the whole idea of, like, what is a mystery story with a political underlying underneath? And this 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 whole, with a political superhero triple triple thing going on here right Mm -hmm. like the idea of what does it mean to be a hero what does it mean to wear a mask what does it mean to um what does it mean to have heroes superheroes quote-unquote superheroes or vigilantes in the sake of nuclear war nuclear uh, apocalypse where would the world stand in authority to superheroes versus cops and all these different like super detailed nuanced themes 
So they go in, they go into all of it. Yeah, I know? mean, it kind of uh, there's there's a lot of comics and and graphic novels that have, have done this before, and I want to make it clear because a lot of people will be like, it's not the first, right. but it's one of the first that that really does the whole idea of the way politics intersect with superheroism mm. in America. Right. We've seen that now in a lot of movies, like uh, Civil War did it. All right, Batman uh, vs. Superman. Batman vs. Superman. But yeah. but my, one of my favorites is Justice League, the animated series. I don't know if you've seen mm. Justice League, the animated series, but yeah. they literally have the whole... They do it really well because they do like a whole season on it where Amanda Waller is kind of in charge of Cadmus Labs and how Cadmus is dealing with the idea of like... The government's control over it's literally BVS, but they do it like over a season, right. uh, and they do it really well because Batman has a lot to say about it. But it's that idea of like in a world where superheroes exist, if you live in America, automatically you would assume that you're gonna work for the American government in some sort of way, right, or some sort of fashion, or be allowed to do what you're doing uh, by the American government. Right. Whether alongside the police or maybe out, outside the police. But but the idea of like, oh, crap, I have a super weapon. His name is Dr. Manhattan. And I happen to be in a war. I mean, for crying out loud, I'm just going to send him to Vietnam and just have him kill everyone. Right. War is over. The end. USA wins. It's over. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what happens in the movie and, and in the graphic novel. And it's that idea of like, if Superman did exist in this world, Superman would be like, Oh yeah, I'm just gonna listen to what the president tells me because I'm an American, so that's what I do. And it's it's that idea of like the danger of what happens in this world of political intersection with superheroes, and it's really interesting because that that's kind of the one of the first stories of of, of dealing with the idea of like you said vigilantes and how they start as the Minutemen with like which is kind of like just like a corporation, mm. um, and then they kind of turn into. Uh, the Watchmen and what it becomes in the graphic novel yeah. and how their sides and their point of views kind of get muddled yeah. with well, all, they everything they interact with. How they break apart because they just can't see eye to eye off of anything. And, that you know, we see uh, in the graphic novel and a little bit in the movie too how everybody first kind of meets at this one meeting where mm-hmm. uh, Captain Midnight's, like, proposing this idea of, like, maybe we should all create, you know, it was the formal... Captain the Minutemen trying to pr- pr- promote to the future members of the Watchmen, hey, we should all team up and we should do something. And literally they all just can't seem to get along like at all. That's in the novel, right? Yeah, yeah, Because in yeah. the movie it's Ozymandias yeah, um, yeah, yeah. doing that meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that, I mean, Ozymandias is also running the ship too for that as well. But yeah, they all – yeah, but exactly. It's the same exact, same exact scene. They all kind of come butting heads because they all have a different philosophy of what – morality really means yeah um, and that's kind of a, a, a I think a, a constant thing um, just throughout like what what throughout the movie and throughout the uh, graphic novel what is um, where, where do you toe the line like are you willing to work with somebody are you willing to tolerate as many things as you're willing to tolerate for um, somebody who you who's quote unquote an ally quote unquote a soldier with you um, especially with Dr. Manhattan and um, and the comedian. I mean, I've seen when they're in the Vietnam War, and then uh, the comedian knocks up um, a Vietnamese lady, and um, and then shoots and her. Shoots, shoots her right there. And he and he tells Dr. Manhattan, "You could have done. You could you could have stopped it. You could have done something about that, uh, but you chose not to." Um, that that to me just goes to show like the greater theme of like what this entire story is about, um, especially told through a perspective of somebody like Dr. Manhattan who is seemingly emotionless, um, what is what 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 is morality and how are you gonna get in the way of, of that? Yeah, and, and the show does even I think the even show a better job. Yeah, the show because it talks about how like the idea of being a god mm-hmm. and how a god doesn't and chooses to like allow bad things to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um and that's like the same thing you just said about that scene where he's like he kind of chose for her to die if he didn't do anything about it, right? Yeah. And it's that idea of like letting bad things happen in certain situations or not getting involved in other situations cuz he right. chose to get involved in the Vietnam War. Right. And, and that's the, that's probably the biggest question that I am f- still have yet to dissect in all of my years of loving the Watchmen um graphic novel is what like the idea of like Dr. Manhattan of like this guy like being character and his seemingly um, non he not to say he doesn't care but he's woefuling 
he after his transformation, he willfully does that just doesn't care about being a human being or mm-hmm. care about human beings in general. Um, so like once the, like does the the question I keep asking myself is does the um, obtaining of that much power actually demoralize a formal person who was a human who is now this invincible being? Does it really corrupt their mind all of that much to where you know uh, to where they just stop? They st- they stop interfering with life in and of itself, um, and that's one of the deepest questions I think that the the comic book addresses. The movie doesn't really have time to address all that much, mm-hmm. but the show definitely gets into as well, like heavily. Um, so I don't know. I'm 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 a really big fan of what <laughs> of the deeper meanings that you could dissect just out of this out of this show in general. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about. Let's talk about what, what how the how the movie ends, how the graphic novel ends, and obviously in the graphic novel it's the giant squid. Yeah. Uh, but in the movie it's Doctor Manhattan and how Ozzy framed Doctor Manhattan. Right. Um, but the whole idea of like, because it's been done before, it's not like it's a new idea of like if you kill people from both sides, how they kind of come together and mm-hmm. kind of like I was explaining it to my brother. It's like the idea of like blame one thing for your anger and everyone would come together on both sides to be against that whatever that enemy is right and they would come yeah. together and say let's go let's go after that and not go after each other and that was the solution that Ozymandias had for stopping the war between USA and Russia mm-hmm. was killing people on both sides and blaming Dr Manhattan yeah. and how the innocent lives are worth it because in the end you're stopping a bigger war that's going to go on for years right. and destroy future generations, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, what do you think of that as an idea? And what do you think of that as just like a super villain? Because it's I love Ozymandias because to me, he's Lex. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I've I've talked a lot about Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor is my favorite villain of all time. Like for right. me, it goes Lex and then Magneto. Mm-hmm. But Lex is always my favorite yeah. because that, that to me is Lex. What people don't – because I've read a lot of Superman comics and what people don't get about Lex is that he's not – He's not this evil, like, super genius doctor who's, you know, cr- screwing up formulas to try and kill Superman. He's much more of, like, very pro-human. And he's, like, doing everything he can for humanity. And he wants to save humanity in his own weird, twisted way, which is kind of what Ozymandias is. Who's worth, he's, he thinks it's worth killing that many people if it's going to have peace. So he is both a superhero and a supervillain, right. which is why he's the perfect Lex to me. Um, and that's why I loved him in the movie, uh, played by Matthew Good. Yeah. Shout out to Matthew Good, who's a great actor. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think of that? What do you think of uh, the whole Ozymandias character? Right. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, I think this movie, the movie didn't have time. Again, it's, it's tough to fit as much stuff as the graphic novel into the movie mm-hmm. as, as they could. So the movie... In and of itself, they they show that, you know, obviously the difference is that Dr. Manhattan exposed multiple places. In the graphic novel, it's really just New York that the damage happens to. But it, it plays to the same theme of, like, what um, what's the moral um, ramifications of um, one of, of sacrificing the individual versus the for the sake of the many. And in this case, Ozymandias takes that to the greatest scale. Um, in, the, in the comic book, they use uh, they they in, if in the four hour cut of the movie because uh, they have a four hour cut, the ultimate cut. Uh, they portray like this uh, comic within the comic called the Black Freighter mm-hmm. story, right? That's right. Um, yeah. yeah. So like the whole throughout the com- throughout the graphic novel is shown throughout all of the chapters with this little black kid who's reading it, and throughout the entire time, you really have no clue like what the correlation is between the main story and that story until you reach um, the end. Until right? you until you reach the very end. And um and it's you know it's revealed that Ozzy Mandias was working with the co-writer of um, the Black Freighter story as if this was kind of his greater piece of fi- fiction. Mm. Um, so the movie kind of portrays it more as like a heroic type of act of like mm-hmm. sacrificing people for the greater good. And I think in the story in the comic book it portrays it more of like self narcissism, right? Mm. Like this idea of like yeah I'm going to be the one who saves the world. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to create the story for it. And I'm going to write the rest of the narrative for the rest of future going forward. And and what I love about the show and I love the portrayal of Ozymandias in the show is that 
he we see all of that succeed and he's still greatly greatly dissatisfied mm-hmm. and i think that's probably one of the uh deepest profound character advancements that we see in any kind of adaptation is just like the idea of un- understanding that a character is still suffering with the consequences especially a a, char- a a bad guy who succeeds is living with the consequences that um of his actions. Of his actions and how is he putting that to rest and how is he coping with that. So I, I I love the way that I love I love the way that we are I love and we're gonna talk about the show probably later on, but how it builds upon each character's journey in a way that we get to a deeper understanding of where they left off from from the comic book. Because everybody in the story leaves in like such a different place. And that's what the the graphic novel ends in such an ambiguous way that you don't, we really have no idea where all the characters are going. And the movie ends in such an ambiguous way where you don't really know where the characters are going. Like, you know, at the end of the, at the, end of the story, we see, well, throughout the story, we see Lori Blake, for example. She, uh, her mother had been raped by the comedian, but then she finds out that the comedian is actually her father this entire time. So in the movie and in the graphic novel, we see her emulating her, her mother's persona, but then, she 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 starts to switch up and becomes a lot more um, <clears throat> developing into her own towards the end of the story. So I like seeing that throughout just throughout this entire story. Um, so yeah, we're a tangent to go off of from the Ozymandias thing, but yeah, I, I think with the Ozymandias overall, the idea of like writing your own narrative, the idea of like telling your story of you creating your own hero path is one of the many themes that the movie and a graphic novel approach. Yeah, I mean, I I, kind of want to close up the chapter at least a little bit on the movie conversation by saying, for the most part, I think it's pretty well regarded. Um, I I mean, I I can pull up right now what it has on Rotten Tomatoes and all that. but but it's probably Zack Snyder's highest rated. I I was going to say, I I would assume it's Zack Snyder's highest rated movie, and for the most part, people enjoy it. Um, overall, uh, I enjoy. It. I, I love it. I yeah, think, I think people. I think people who really like watch who who read Watchmen and obviously people have criticisms and you know whatever. But I think people who understand the difficulty that would come with adapting a graphic novel like that and seeing what Zack Snyder did, they should be applauding. Especially you know to fit all of that to two hours and thirty minutes. It, it, it it's a little, it's a lot. You know, like, <laughs> like and I think what Snyder did was actually really, really brilliant. I, and I hope he gets to make more uh, graphic novel movies down the line that aren't Batman versus Superman. Yeah, he's good at it, man. Yeah, he's good at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's go, let's transition a little bit into the show just because I feel like there's a lot to get through in the show. So yeah. we, we can always take a break and then come back. Yeah. Um, I, I want to open up this conversation with how just a conversation. I, I listened to the official Watchmen podcast. I don't know if you yeah. did. Yeah, I did too, yeah. Um, And the way the podcast opens up is literally the way I kind of want to open up this conversation. It's Mm -hmm. why Damon Lindelof wanted to do this story Mm -hmm. and and what this story means. And and I kind of want to open it up by asking, like, what what are sequels now and what Damon Lindelof chooses to do with the sequel? Would you consider this show to be a sequel? Yeah. To the graphic novel? Yeah, it's a sequel through and through. Yeah. I think think what they did really, really well is – they took the core concepts of Watchmen, mm-hmm. like the idea of, and you know we didn't touch on it when we talked about the movie as much, but because it wasn't as prevalent in the movie. But I think probably the biggest thing in Watchmen that wasn't included in the movie, but that is featured prevalently in the show, is the idea of nostalgia, right? Like mm-hmm. how dangerous it is to constantly be reflecting on the past. I mean, that's the whole idea of Doctor Manhattan, his whole time mental yeah, structure. Yeah, because he is, could see in the past always. Yeah, right? he sees in the past, present, and future simultaneously. Yeah. So his nostalgia is his present. He's always living in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is always the central conflict of, uh, of, of of the entire story. Even the show the show, and the comic book, oh, I, I'll say this, the, the show brilliantly adapts the structure of the comic book because the comic book just kind of jumps all over the place. Things are taking place at simultaneous times as other things are taking place you're not really sure when things are happening until you like you really get to the end and really like fully digest what's happening and I think the show does a brilliant job of doing that too Mm. like the idea of manipulation of time and manipulation of structure in order to serve this overall greater narrative of reflecting on the past and reflecting on 
uh, the present and how living in the past and the present aren't necessarily the most helpful things. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I look at I look at the Watchmen TV show and I bring up just questions about just the future of filmmaking in general and just the future of television and the future of sequels in general. Right. Just because there's been a huge conversation recently in Hollywood about sequelitis, mm. for example, and about like what it means to have IP and what IP, the power of IP, I guess, is what's happening now, especially with Disney buying everything right. and the idea that they can do anything they want because they have all the IP in the world. And now there's a conversation and a conversation I had with uh, with Ken mm-hmm. about Star Wars right. and how a lot of people were so critical of uh, the sequel trilogy right. because they felt like it didn't want to, it's a sequel, but it didn't want to do anything new. Mm. And then... I opened it up with the idea of how studios look at IP and how they look at even Game of Thrones. We had it about Game of Thrones and their new show that's coming out. And, right, it's and gonna be a prequel, right? It's gonna be a yes, it's gonna be a prequel, but but the way Ken and I broke it down was was very like fundamental. Like right. what are you taking from the show that people like? Oh, we're gonna take the dragons. It's, it's a show literally about the dragon family. Mm-hmm. And I was like, why'd they go there and not here? It's mm-hmm. because dragons probably sell more money. Even though it costs more money, right. they want more people to tune in. So it's this idea of like you're trying to sell a product based on an IP that some people might know about. What do you choose to keep in? What do you choose to keep out? Is is an issue that a lot of studios face. And usually the studios usually just say, do what you did in the first movie. I mean, there's an yeah. entire movie that makes fun of it. 22 Jump Street yeah. literally makes fun of it the entire movie. Mm. But it's that idea of like, what is a sequel? Um, and it's this idea of like, do something new, push the envelope. And when you say words like do something new, push the envelope, everyone's like, oh, yeah, dark and gritty. (laughs) No, but what I'm saying is like that's so easy to say. But then there's a completely different side of people and fans Mm. who are like, no, this is sacred text. You can't blah, 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 blah. You have to stay faithful to the original because the original. blah blah. So it's like, what do you do if I do this side? I'm getting angry at the at the Star Wars fans who are like, you have to stay faithful to the original trilogy, blah blah blah. Right. If I go to the other side, I'm you know I'm gonna alien fans who who are like, come on, do something new. We've seen this before. Right. And it's this idea of like you can't really have it either way. And Damon Lindelof, I think he breaks it down on that podcast. No, it's another one. It's on the watch. He breaks it down on the watch, mm. and how he said the way he viewed it was like he's so tired of. Peter Parker, Peter Parker, Peter Parker. How many Spider-Mans have we seen? Mm. And he loved Into the Spider-Verse because finally it was like, it's Spider-Man, but it's a different Spider-Man. Mm. And it's the idea of like, it's technically a Spider-Man sequel, a Spider-Man movie. It's the same story, but you're seeing it through a different lens, a different perspective, a different idea of what Spider-Man is. Right. And, and he talked about um, how all the stories he's wanted to do is 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 to try and go a different avenue with the original story that we know of and it's like may, that's so interesting because most people kind of scoff and he said as long as you keep the core themes do what you want he's right. he's like if you want to make superman black make him black if you want to do this do that like there's no unbreakable rule or or cardinal sin that you can commit when you're doing these kind of sequels and and i was like wow that's such a refreshing point of view because most people are like no batman has to be white or this has to be this and peter parker's this and peter parker's that like people are afraid to go against the grain i I don't know i'm curious what you think of this whole idea of what's happening in hollywood now with with sequels and movies and ips um yeah i mean it's it's you know i think what watchman does brilliantly is that it takes the, the core themes and it, it's not a, it's not an adaptation of the plot per se it's an adaptation of the themes right it is a sequel that addresses the exact same themes that were addressed in the Watchmen graphic novel but it takes it and recontextualizes it to a whole different new character a new audience and a new undertone and I you know they did a brilliant job of you know taking the most prevalent issue of back in the 80s was nuclear holocaust the the, the red scare the cold war and then and today's era is the idea of race and the idea of respirations and the idea of anxiety politically especially you know the show does a great job of touching on the political ramifications of of colonialism and um and how 
a figure like Robert Redford, for example, is who becomes president, how there's a seemingly over the left-leaning kind of government establishment and how characters are reacting to that as opposed to right now where we're living in a super right-wing leaning government and how people in real life are reacting to that. Mm-hmm. How the the mass movement of today, um, how the mass movement of today with the KKK and the new Nazis and the neo-Nazis is aligned with the Warshak's rhetoric of, uh, you know, that's presented uh particularly strong through the graphic novel as well. So and and they so what I think is brilliant is that they took the environment that the that the graphic novel bred, created a whole new world around it based on those ideas and took the themes that the graphic novel did and took those ideas and built that into something completely new and original. A lot of times sequels just take, oh, here's what the plot was in this movie let's do that plot again but with new characters or here's what that plot was in this movie let's make a sequel to the plots and but you're not supposed to you shouldn't make a sequel to the plot you should make a sequel to the overall greater themes the, the reasons why people like the material in the first place yeah so. and you're saying that this is a faithful adaptation of the graphic novel and the irony rb3 and i know this is something you roll your eyes at which you should but the irony that most people are like wait a minute this isn't Watchmen. Yeah. And then you're asked, what, what do you mean? They're like, Watchmen's white. Like, all, all these characters are supposed to be white. Why, why are they black now? And it's like, yeah. people are... There was an out, there was an actual backlash for that. Yeah, do you I remember know. that? Yeah, I know. For I the know. TV show? Yeah, I know. They were just like, wait a minute. Yeah. This movie, what what is the show trying to say? Yeah. Like, black people... Yeah. All of a sudden, they're really mad because their original Watchmen was like all white people. And all of a sudden, there's black people in there. Well, to be and fair... And people get mad. To be fair, even when I saw the trailers for the Watchmen show, I was like, oh, I hope they're just not just like doing some shit just for the sake of doing some shit. You know what I mean? What I hope they're not just putting race... I hope they're just not putting Regina King in this for the sake of putting Regina King in and she's going to be the only black but the person in entire, entire sh- show. But the entire show is about race, though. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why I came to um, loving loving this show. Yeah. I think that's why, to me, this is a seminal... When this, greatest seminal TV achievements that we've had in a long time because it actually found an identity in and of itself. And it did that through taking material that was in the graphic novel and expanding upon it. And that's why I think it's key. They'll take some shit that was in exactly like one panel of the graphic novel and take it and completely flip it into something completely new and different because that's what good storytelling is. It's taking mm-hmm. the little details and, and flustering it out and expanding upon it. Um, and that's what I really loved about this show. So if I'm a, if I'm a studio executive and I say, and, and you're pitching to me Watchmen, right? And and I and I'm let's say I'm a fan of Watchmen, whatever. Sure. I love the movie or something. And and you're telling me this stuff. And my concern is always going to be, as a studio executive or as a producer, right? Is going right. to be like, what about the people who don't really know about this story? How do we get them involved? Right. How do we make sure they tune in and they stay tuned in? to watching Watchmen. Right. How would you answer that? Well, fortunately, you know, before I answer that, fortunately, the Watchmen has the, the great situation of having a movie that was a faithful adaptation before. Mm-hmm. Um, so people, I think a lot more people knew about Watchmen because of the movie, just because the movie came out. Like, people got more familiar with the story of Watchmen because of the movie, and they picked up the graphic novel. Some people might have picked up the graphic novel because of that. But most people know the story of Watchmen not most people, I should say, but a lot more people know about Watchmen because the movie came out first. And yes, that, that, that's 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 awesome. That's that that's the perfect situation for Demi Lindelof to kind of be handed this this the the show. Um, no, but what I'm saying is like, but in, in I, I of, love the movie, and I, and then I'm just like, oh, I want to make it in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm gonna be like, bro, what yeah. about New York, man? What about Chicago? Like, I'm yeah. I'm assuming like. You know, that's not Watchmen. Watchmen is in Oklahoma. Watchmen's New York, bro. Let's, yeah. let's talk about what happened after the explosion in New York. Like, yeah, exactly. That would be my, if I'm a studio or if I'm a producer, I'm going to say that, right? Yeah, it takes a brave pitch. I mean, it takes somebody who's smart like Damian Lindelof to, 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 and somebody who's smart and has the amount of clout and the amount of freedom like Damian Lindelof to, to be able to do this show without seemingly any creative borders, it looks like. Um, I think I, I got trepidatious because, you know, this – Adaptations coming after the AT and T buyout of Warner Warner Brothers and, yeah, and Warner HBO Media. and yeah. Warner Media and all that stuff. So and this looked like a, a total AT and T thing, right? Let's take our most sophisticated 
but our most mainstream DC comic book and put it on HBO. Um, and that seemed like the most AT&T studio corporation thing that ever happened to me. That's why I got worried about the show. I thought it was just going to be a lot of that. And accurate. I told you, I remember, I know, just because yeah. we're bringing it up, but uh, I was like, bro, I'm hyped for this show. Yeah, I yeah. love Watchmen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I, I was talking about the movie. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I, I feared the corporate hacker yeah. was going to get in the way. Fortunately, it didn't. And, and, and they managed to make a story that was self-contained and had its own life and had its own original take on it. So. Yeah, uh, I, I want to go to break, but before I do, I, I want to finish up this conversation by saying that fear you had, mm. you have that fear because you've seen this happen so many times, yeah, right? You've yeah. seen so many sequels that are just not good, right? Yeah. Like how many franchises can we name that are kind of on their way out? Terminator is one example for yeah, Transformers. Transformers. Yeah. But, but the idea of like making sequels for the sake of sequels and just doing whatever happened in the first one and then just, you know, sprinkling in some new characters. Yeah. And that is kind of what's happened to Hollywood. I, I think about it in a very Star Wars sense just because Star Wars is my go-to IP. That's my favorite thing. Right. Um, and I always think about this idea of, like, what Star Wars is and what's it, what's it capable of mm. uh, and, and what it can do to generations of, of people who just watch movies, um, which is why it's just a fascinating conversation to have of, of what George... Uh, did did you read the, the Bob Iger book? No, I haven't, I haven't read but, it. But way. the idea that, like, it's really... His chapter on George Lucas is really interesting because he basically talks about how George was, like, at a point of, like, just... He was just so... He was just, like, shaking and being like, bro, I'm telling you, people want to see something new. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> make something do. new. Make something weird. Make something different yeah. with my property, with my IP. Mm-hmm. And then he gave him all the pitches of, of where Star Wars was supposed to go. And Bob Iger was like... That's cool, man. But nah, man. Uh, I'm gonna make something that that uh, it feels like your first movie, and it's it's literally what Bob Iger said. And a lot of people blame JJ, but that was kind of Bob Iger's idea to make mm-hmm. it like like a New Hope, All where right. it's just like let's do a, let's do a New Hope again. Right. And, and George was like, Nah, bro, make it make it new. Like people want to see new stories, mm-hmm. um, and, and make it different, and just have him say something. That's that's the point of my Star Wars story, is what George was telling Bob, and Bob was very much like, no, we're going to get, like, real cool graphics and, and, and make it really grounded and make it look like A New Hope. And it's like, yeah. bro, who cares how it looks? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, George was like, bro, who cares? I shot mod on a blue screen <laughs> exactly. for crying out loud. Who gives a crap how it looks? That's what, it, what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, but Bob was very focused on, like, the look and the feel, and it's like the first one. And it's like, bro, who cares? Yeah. Um, it's the idea, again, of over, over relying on nostalgia. And it thankfully, the show, the show, the, thankfully, somebody smart enough like Damian Lindelof read the material, understood the material deep enough to say, hey, let's not do it the exact same way as this. Because, you know, outside of how great the graphic novel is in and of itself, some, a couple of the ideologies that are presented in it are a little dated. Mm. So um, I'm glad that, and the, the, but the more important part is, as it's excluding the dated materials, it's also adding relevant material too. Mm. And that's what's important, right? Like the idea of switching up the nuclear holocaust threat in the first one and switching that into a race set 2019 present day moment kind of question that we're dealing with and and conflict that we're dealing with switching that up and making it about the present and making it about now ultimately gives it a whole new level and a whole new uh, way of relevancy so absolutely super important uh we're going to talk about that more after the break but first we're going to go to break guys make sure you guys stay tuned in because we're going to be keeping talking about the hbo show of Watchmen. This ain't funny, so don't you dare laugh With the 450 divide you in half You getting at me equals a club pass You do the math Take you out the equation The following is a clip from Ace and RB3's review of Bad Boys for Life. Enjoy. But now we got to get into the first spoiler that you got to yeah. say. What well, is I it? I got to I mean we talked about DJ Khaled cameos this other the other Cameos day. were amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I got to I got to show love to Bad Boys 3 for including the GOAT. Michael Bay is back. He was in this hey, movie. Babe. You walked you walked to the bathroom when uh when Michael Bay came on. But <laughs> there's there was a there's a there's a there I'm not going to lie. My heart kind of grinned a little bit when I saw Michael Bay pop up just for that one Was scene. he in the he club? Love. No, it was, it was during the wedding when um when Oh, uh, okay, when they got married. Yeah, yeah. Also 
great on them for bringing back Reggie. That was that was the one that killed me. <laughs> yeah. I died, bro. I didn't even hear what he said because yeah. I was laughing so hard. Yeah. They brought back Reggie, yeah, man. Yeah, they brought back Reggie. Oh, they, 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 they had a lot of funny. Good, they had a lot of great funny. callbacks. They had a lot of great callbacks. Come along, children. Now we're going to have a little music. What is up, guys? We're back talking about Watchmen. Now we're going to talk about the HBO show that premiered last year, at the end of last year. I believe you said yeah. the last week of October. I think it was last week of October. Uh, I, I just remember it November and December yeah. is when I watched it. Mm-hmm. Um, but now we're going to be talking about that show. Uh, we already were talking about it and kind of how it deals with the whole sequel uh, angle. It's a sequel to the graphic novel, not necessarily to the movie. But if you've seen the movie, it gives you a lot of context, I feel. Um, yeah. To certain characters and, and certain themes inside the show, mm-hmm. um, but dude, this show, the the, the most fascinating thing, and it kind of goes back to my sequel conversation, is the idea of the way Damon Lindelof came to create the show, and he said that when he was thinking about doing Watchmen and bringing it to HBO, he read this book. Um, I forget. Oh, I wrote it down. It's called "Between the World and Me." Um, Tallahassee Coates. That guy. Mm-hmm. That's right. And and an article in the Atlantic that he wrote. Um, the case for reparations. Case for reparations. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, after reading that and learning about the black uh, Black Wall Street massacre of 1921, something he didn't know about. And then at the same time, while he was reading that, and and learning about it, and, and reading that book, it was the Charlottesville. Uh, March in 2016. Mm-hmm. Um, so all this stuff just started to kind of hit him. And then he started to realize like, oh, no, like if I'm going to bring Watchmen into 2019, this is the way to do it. This is this is the the conversation that is to be had. And that was his pitch to HBO was like coming off that book and that article and coming into what he's seeing now with the Charlottesville um, March that was happening where he said, Someone told him as he as he was watching it was like, wow, you know, back in the day, the KKK would wear masks. Now these people don't even wear masks anymore. They're just white supremacist and proud and showing it. And then he started to think about the idea of what a mask is and, and, and what that represents mm. uh, and, and what not wearing one or wearing one means, which is like a huge theme inside the show. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> literally the inside the graphic novel, too. A graphic novel, too. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Yeah. But now what I kind of really break it down to and i know there's a lot happening through all nine episodes it's a nine episodes uh uh, season i believe Mm -hmm. um there's a lot to be said but i I really go back to episode six Mm -hmm. uh which i I think it's called the extraordinary being this extraordinary being which is which is the hooded justice uh episode Mm -hmm. but for me i kind of want to start with this just because it's the one that kind of reaches out to me the most Mm -hmm. it's the idea of the recontextualization of a superhero in America right. and what that means. And, and, I, and, and we talked about how in the, in the first Watchmen, the, sh- the, the movie and the graphic novel talks about like the political integration of like how politics and superheroism and vigilanteism kind of go hand in hand and how right. we, would you work for the government, would you be against the government kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and in this show, they kind of break it down where they say, this is a world where superheroes exist. Right. Mm-hmm. And this is a world where the idea of superheroes came. Obviously, Dr. Manhattan is the only superpowered being in this world. Right. But even just the idea of vigilantism came mm. through hooded justice. Mm. And everyone who became a superhero inside the Minutemen group was inspired by the first superhero, mm. which is hooded justice. And then. You have this idea of like, oh, I'm inspired by this guy. But the idea that behind the mask is actually a black man mm-hmm. living in this really horrible time in New York City, mm-hmm. fighting the KKK. And the reason why he put on a mask, almost essentially, it, it, in the show, it's, it's to help that family, that couple. Mm-hmm. But the idea that his mission, his passion to put on the mask was to fight the KKK. Like mm-hmm. that was his superhero vigilante mission was to fight the KKK and that's why he put on the mask and it recontextualizes the idea of like what is a superhero in our world and I'm talking about the real world right Mm -hmm. and and how we view superheroism 
is this idea of like, uh, 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 for example, I, I know I'm throwing Batman under the bus and we've done it in many episodes, but I'm going to do it again of this rich, angry white guy who needs justice because he has the tools and the resources to fight back with all the weapons he has and his smarts and his upbringing because all that stuff that made him Bruce Wayne is going to use is going to help him to fight against injustice in Gotham City right that's how that's what a superhero is mm. but the irony that the, that the first superhero inside this Watchmen world was inspired by Superman and I love that quick little two second scene inside this episode or like 10 second scene when when someone when when the like the Jewish guy at the at the newsstand mm. is reading the first superhero co- action comic one mm. and he's reading it and he's saying oh what are you reading and he's like oh it's the story of this kid from a different planet like he's not from here he's he's from a different culture a different planet coming down to earth and he's the last of his people and 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 he, and he's fighting for for us mm. that that's who superman is and he hears that and he's like oh my god that's me because he remembers like that's he was the last of that, you know, Black Wall Street massacre, mm. literally put inside a box. Like he's literally, he feels that connection towards Superman mm. and that kind of inspires him. But when you think about Superman in real life, Superman was created by two Jew- Jewish authors mm. and, and was created in 1938, literally like the precursor to Hitler, to Nazism, to the Holocaust. This is what inspired Superman. And yet the way S- Superman has been recontextualized to be white and, 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 and only white and super, you know, Americana and this and, 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 and American flag flying in the back. Like that's Superman to, uh, to, to American culture. Mm-hmm. And yet he came from this idea of like feeling out of place. He's from a different planet. He's from Krypton. He's not from here. Mm-hmm. And he's doing his best to, to give the people of Earth what he can. And he's an immigrant coming from a different world, being better than humanity, even though humanity rejects him. I don't know. That just blew my mind. I was like, wow, the first superhero is a black guy. Yeah. That's so cool. I don't know what you think about that episode and, and the idea of like superheroes inside this Watchmen world were inspired by a black superhero, yeah. which happens to be the first one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a that's a super prevalent theme. Again, they they took ideas that were just present like for a panel or two in the graphic novels, right? Like you don't really even meet Hilda Justice like all that much into the graphic novel in and of itself. Like and you especially don't meet him in the movie. Um, but what I think, you know, in going even more so off the point of like him being inspired by Superman, he's not only inspired by Superman, he's also inspired by Sal uh, by, by Bass Reeves. Bass Reeves, right? yeah. At of the, course. At the beginning of the film. Yes. Who's, um, who's the uh, who's the marshal of uh yeah, I think Oklahoma. I'm not Oklahoma. sure. I think it was like Oklahoma. Old, yeah, something like that. But an actual historical figure who they shown in the movie, um, in this like in this in this silent film type of type of environment, and uh, how seeing yourself represented on screen uh, actually ends up influencing um, you in the future. I mean, we even see that theme continued with Angela when she picks up um, in Sister episode Knight. Seven when she picks up the Sister Knight uh, uh, VHS and she's like, I see myself in this character. That's why I want to. That's why I want to be like that. Um, but you know, but you know, it kind of goes to the um, the media portrayal of like African American heroes and stuff like that. How that's influential. But it goes into the more negative side of the portrayal of mask, right? How both in the how in the silent film that we see at the very beginning of the series, Bass Reeves is taking off this mask to unveil himself as his black hero. And how and sister in this case of Sister Knight, she's wearing this mask uh, in this black exploitation movie that Angela later, later adapts. But I think what the show does really brilliantly uh, is brings it ties into the theme of the graphic novel of like what are ma- are masks even actually good things to begin with? Um, how are we using masks to, you know? And I I'm quoting directly from um, from Lori in in this in this part and I think in episode four where she says. Um, Matt, you know, people wear masks to hide the pain, and uh, and that's something that is true to real life. That is what the KKK is. That mm-hmm. is something that is uh, a pain. You know, they're they're hiding themselves from the pain, uh, from their own interior pain, and externalizing that onto innocent black people. Mm-hmm. That's how people in China, most recently in Hong Kong, how they had those giant protests and they're wearing masks. You know, 
to, to protect themselves, but to, to also hide the pain that they're suffering because of the oppressive government that they're under. Mm-hmm. How um, how in today's era, people are just like wearing masks. I mean, people are wearing masks all, all over. Well, I mean, you could say online is, yeah, is a yeah. mask. Yeah, I consider it to be a mask. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's what's particularly fascinating about a show like Watchmen. I mean, they don't really dive into it deeply. They don't say it explicitly, but you have to read the PD, PDpedia files on on the website for the Watchmen for the show, but they don't even have internet in this series at all. So the whole idea of like this cavalry that's inspired by Warshack, um, they are all wearing the Warshack mask because they are using that as a symbol um, to represent their, you know, their super, anger. Yeah, yeah, their super anger, their super prejudice towards black people and towards authority in general. And, you know, the show got a lot of controversy. We're talking about the um, the the off camera we're talking about the whole idea of like uh, the 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 white supremacists had a big problem with this movie yeah uh, because of the way they portrayed Warshack as like this super right wing white supremacist guy but again people who um, people who don't pay attention to the graphic novel don't really understand that like the, the whole time they're telling you that this dude is a fucked up dude to begin with like there's nothing to be trusted about Warshack even in the graphic novel the magazine who he sends the reason why even though the the, the movie and the graphic novel ends with the seemingly bright ending of like him getting his journal submitted to uh, this this magazine so they could publish it the reason why it doesn't the reason why nobody why it's like it's still a conspiracy theory in this world is because uh, in the graphic novel he literally sends it to an alt right Magazine, yeah, he that, does. Yeah, that are literally full of like Nazis, super hyper racist people. That's why it catches a niche with the white supremacists in this show. That's why the new KKK, the Seventh Cavalry, in this show are wearing th- these Warshack masks. And again, it's it's, it's people who believe. And, and meanwhile, on the flip side of that, we have a character like Looking Glass, who's also dealing with his own version of pain, who's wearing a mask the entire time too. And how these two different people internalize. How they're two different sets of people looking people like looking glass who take their mask and use it for justice, but they're still hiding the pain of the traumatic events that happened back in like nineteen eighty five versus people like white supremacists in the seventh cavalry who are taking their Warshack mask and using that as their anger towards society and their anger towards black people and, and uh, people of color in general. So it, it it dives so deeply into both sides of like, and that's what's great about the show and the graphic novel. It gives you both sides, multiple sides of the coin, but it does condemn the overall idea of like wearing mask in general. Absolutely. It, yeah. it, to me, I, I still find it fascinating to see the way the show contextualizes both inside the show, but also outside the show. Yeah, I just really like the idea of and we're like, spoilers. There's the spoilers, by the way. Are we doing? Spoilers? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hundred yeah, percent. Super, super clear in the beginning. <laughs> I was just about to say something. I mean, I already spoiled it with yeah. the bit of justice. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, a big that's a big spoiler. Yeah. Um, but the idea that that we have the, the media and so many different people, the way they view superheroes by default is white. And, and Lori has that grain line in, in, I think, in episode seven, where she says, when a white guy puts on a mask, he's a superhero. Mm. When a black guy puts on a mask, he's a villain. Mm. He's a monster. Right. And it's that idea of, like, that's, that's our perception because that's all we've seen. Mm-hmm. We've seen comic books for years only be white people right. for such a long time that now IP and media perceives it as, like, well, it's got to be a white guy, another white guy, another white girl. And it's that idea of like when we introduce like, well, what about a black guy? People just I mean, the comic book fans and and people really show their true colors, like you said about this show where they said, oh, I'm not going to watch the show. It's against white people. And it's like, whoa, all of a sudden it's like we they get really mad when you're trying to do a black superhero or, or a different point of view. Because it's, oh, it's not the way it's been done before. It's not traditional. It's not what I've seen. Mm. And it's like, yeah, because what you've seen is through a really racist point of view. (laughs) It's like a time period where there wasn't those opportunities for people to be making the black superheroes, man. Mm. And and that's what what blows my mind about this show is that it it shows you inherently, if you think about it, I I was thinking about it as I was was listening to the podcast and as, as I was listening to... Uh, conversations about the show. I, what is a superhero? Mm. What is a superhero, right? And I, and I started to, oh, it's a vigilante. 
It's someone who feels that the law inside their own country isn't doing enough for them. It, they feel like the current policing system, the current government is not doing enough for me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my own charge, my own mission, put on, put on a mask, become a superhero to fight for justice for the people who aren't being fought for. That's inherently what a superhero is, right? And in this world, it's hooded justice, a black guy saying, this America doesn't want me, doesn't want to fight for me, doesn't care about the KKK. I do. I care about the KKK and I care about fighting for justice. And I'm not getting that because the law isn't doing enough. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to become a vigilante, put on a mask and fight against the injustice that I that I don't see that our U.S. government is fighting for. Yeah. They're fighting for the white people, but they're not fighting for anyone else. Yeah. And that's inherently the idea of what a superhero is. And this idea that so much of the media and so much of different people view it as like, oh, it's a white dude. It's, a, it's like, no, bro, inherently a superhero is someone who doesn't feel like they're being seen by the law. They're being seen by the government. They feel like they need to go outside the law to fight for their people. And yeah. I was like, oh, my God. That's what a superhero is in, in America. And the idea that we fast, we, we put it in this idea and this ideology that they have to be by default white. And mm -hmm. people get mad when they're not. You, yeah. know what, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. how many people got mad at, like, Into the Spider-Verse and Miles Morales? And how many people get mad at this show? And it, it, it's just how many people got mad at Black Panther getting nominated for Oscar? Like, it really is something that we see nowadays. And the irony is that... They're just proving the point. Superman, the first ever superhero, was created from a point of view of of being, of, of a being an outsider, of being an immigrant, of being someone who's not satisfied with what they're being seen, of fighting against racism. Superman, that's the origin of Superman is fighting against race because of how they felt. And that's why they introduced the character of Superman. And it's that irony that now they think that that's what it is. And it's like, bro, no, you're missing the point. Well, see, even Well, I think even on a deeper level, I think... Uh, we were talking about like the definition of a superhero, right? The, and the definition of a superhero origin story. It's the idea of like the uh, a character, like you said, who's disillusioned with justice, but they're using their disillusionment with like justice and people because they're personally affected by it. Because Batman so witnessed Bruce Wayne witnessed his parents getting shot in the streets and no police being there to do anything about it. Because Spider Man let the wrestler go and um, and let his uncle be shot. Because uh, because Superman, what, not quite literally witnessed this planet being exploded, but he is from a different place and he's not belonging where he uh, should be. Um, and on the flip side, Joker, because he got bullied by Squall Street guys and decided to shoot him. Like that's you know it, it, it goes it goes to show. And even in this show, he uh, we see that um, Hood of Justice William Will Reeves he he tries to. He, he tries to take in somebody who's uh, burning down a Jewish deli, mm -hmm. um, trying to take down racism in the beginning. But he becomes frustrated in the system when he realizes that him trying to play along with the system is only setting him further back. It's literally almost getting him killed. So he has to step outside of that system in order to, to work with it. And, it you know, um, it the show does a good job of showing why that is necessary, but also does condemn... Uh, his actions and the fact that he's wearing a mask consistently, right? I mean, we see, especially in episode six, which I think is brilliant, how deeply uh, impacted um, his family was from it, right? The young boy who end up who eventually ends up becoming the father to Angela um, is estranged from his father going forward, and Angela doesn't even have a relationship with Will Reeves. That's why he doesn't she doesn't know who he is because because quite literally. Um, he was wearing a mask. He, you know, he was willing to put his superhero isms and his superhero actions above um, that of his family. Uh, and 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 again, that's a trope that we see in a lot of superhero material, right? Like we don't see people. We don't see we, most superheroes don't even have kids. Batman doesn't have kids. Nobody really has kids because the idea of having kids just gets in the way of things. And then you could, and the idea of having a family just gets in the way of things. And his family left him. Thus, adding another layer of generational trauma to a young Angela Abar, who ends up invoking that same trauma in her own type of way, putting on her own mask. Uh, and this, it, and again, this this idea of like, and the show 
touches on it through all bloodstreams, streams, right? Through Will, through Will Reeves. Uh, through Ozymandias. Yeah, to, to Ozymandias. To Lori Blake. Yeah, to Lori Blake. Even to an, a, a certain extent to Dr. Manhattan, too, right? Mm. Like, his idea of, like, him as a kid witnessing mm. the first time that sex and reproduction yeah, was creation. happening. And creation was happening in this process. That, that... I actually love that scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how, and how, and how that's flipped onto him literally creating the exact beings that he's been that yeah, he was inspired the by beginning. yeah exactly yeah. so it's, it's it, it goes to a deep level of like what how much we rely on trauma how much how much of our character is built on trauma and how much of our interactions and how much of our memories are built on nostalgia and how much of that is is uh Conscious or subconscious? Yeah, I just feel uh, I'll close up the the section of the conversation. Uh, just like you said, man, before we went to break, the scene where she has the VHS of Sister Night yeah. and she just kind of shrugs and says, "Why do you care so much about Sister Night?" She's like, "I don't know. She just looks like me." Yeah. And just the way she breaks it down, and, and I think about it on on an outside perspective, mm-hmm. on on an outside perspective of like the idea of representation now and how so many people roll their eyes and. Like, oh, my God, like, why do you care? Why does it need to be a this? Why does it need to be a brown? Why does it need to be a black person? Why does it need to be? Yeah. And it's this idea of like, bro, like it really does change perspective. Mm. A, a, a default isn't white. Mm. Like your idea of like, I'm thinking of this guy. He has this and you create a story inside of your head. Is it a white guy? Like, why does it have to be that by default? Why right. can't you embrace the idea of. A, a, a diverse world that we live in with so many different cultures and faiths and religions and backgrounds and that's what that's what humanity is mm-hmm. and so many people fight against that just in in now in real life so yeah. I, I just found it fascinating to to see how this show dealt with the idea of a superhero yeah. um, but let's talk about that 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 idea that you were talking about right now about bloodstream and about legacy mm-hmm. uh, I, I've had I've thought a lot about legacy um, these past few days um, just because it's such a powerful thing and this show kind of deals with it in a perspective of the characters of obviously Regina King's Angela yeah Angela Abar um, going from Angela to Lori mm. to um, Lady True yeah Lady True what do you think of these other characters let's start with uh, let's start with Lady True mm-hmm. of her character being the daughter of Ozymandias a big spoiler um, and being <laughs> come on man I already said now. spoilers <laughs> get it by now. <laughs> uh, being the daughter of Ozymandias and, and kind of putting it on herself that she's gonna be the next savior of humanity yeah what do you think I love that story but I want to hear your opinion on it yeah no it was um it's interesting because yeah it, it does go to the idea of like her you know and Ozymandias literally says it at the end of the show he like, does yeah I know her too well she's not gonna be the one to enact this kind of greater change that she thinks she's gonna enact she's a narcissist just like he is yeah and you know you could totally see that just throughout the entire story um the fact that First of all, I think the fact that Ozymandias was literally encased in, like, this trophy, like, gold stuff from yeah. the very beginning. And you see him introduced in episode four, and you have no idea that that was him the entire time. I think that, just from Jump, is, is brilliant. Um, and, uh, but I think, moreover, the idea of, like, Lady True being this seemingly artificial creator of life. I mean, she clones her own mother. She offers to... she In order to get a, a house or a piece of property, she literally creates a, a a baby, a clone baby for a couple and is willing to destroy this clone's life in exchange for um in exchange for buying their property. It just goes to show how useless life is to her. Like she is so focused on tampering with life and obsessed with life. She already has this guy complex going into the idea of stripping Dr. Manhattan's powers away and and taking those forward. So imagine her with Dr. Manhattan's powers, right? Like what kind of havoc will she wreak there? Um in the beginning, I really didn't know how to feel about her character. Mm. I was like, who is she? Like, they're just kind of throwing some new billionaire out there to begin with. But I eventually, and it goes to the greater theme of, like, colonialism, right? Mm. The idea of, like, her Vietnamese mother, um, her Vietnamese mother was frustrated with um, the imperialistic government. I mean, we see a lot of the cases of imperialism in the show and how that affects the, the the death of An- Angela's mom, but but also in this particular instance with with Ozymandias, um, she takes his 
literal sperm puts it in herself just as an act of revenge, right? Yeah. As an act of like, I'm going to get back at you for all the, I'm going to get back at you, America, for all of the dis, um, service says that y'all have done to our country at the hands of this Vietnam War and actually went into Vietnam as a result of Dr. Manhattan. And again, that kind of, that I, that relationship that ultimately Dr. Manhattan, this godlike figure, kind of enacts on throughout the entire story. There wouldn't be this whole uh, Viet- Vietnam America crossover without Dr. Manhattan intervening in the Vietnam War. There wouldn't be, so that as a result, Angela's parents could possibly still be alive. You know, we wouldn't see uh, uh, an Ozymandias uh, daughter from this Vietnamese woman. Like, that just wouldn't happen. But because of this, um, because of this overriding being controlling the narrative of the story, this is where these characters end up lying up, further adding to, like, the God complex story that this, that this thing is approaching and how characters like Lady Chu and characters like Ozymandias are doing their best to try and break out of this quote-unquote God-driven narrative. Yeah. So. No, I, I mean, I just it's interesting because if you go inside Pedipedia, they talk about how uh, Lady True's mother, I forgot her name, yeah. um, kind of went out of her way to create the, the better version of Ozymandias. And she yeah. trained her and she trained her in martial arts. She like gave her all the best tutors and study people and wanted to send her all the best schools. And she wanted to go out of her way to almost create this, like you said, artificial uh, person that is just there on a mission and her mission her whole life has been to like save humanity so she feels like she is somehow superior a superior being yeah which is exactly what ozymandias felt in in the graphic novel yeah well instead of ozymandias finding justification for killing three million people she's finding this as justification for killing an actual quote-unquote god you know so that's what that's what's really uh deep and sickening about her character um one thing i want to bring up and kind of going on this track is is the idea of like your family tree and legacy uh something that damon lindenoff mentioned on a podcast while talking about this show is this idea of knowing where you come from and knowing what your history is and 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 who your your great grandparents were and, and knowing all this history of your people, of your culture right. is something that's actually really powerful for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and the show talks about it a lot with the, with the acorn and the family tree thing. Yeah. Um, and obviously a- Angela Abar's family and learning that, you know, Hooded Justice was her grandfather. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it goes back into the Lady True and then in the Lori Blake situation as well. Yeah. But it's this. Our, I- our, yeah, exactly. Okay. But it's this idea of like, what is your, are you your parents' daughter? Are you your father's daughter? Are you your mother's daughter? Mm. Are you your father's son? Kind of thing mm. as far as like the same characteristics and the same trauma, the same pain, the same ideology or passions mm. kind of get interjected into future parents. generations. Yeah. yeah. And whether it's Angela or whether it's Lori or whether it's Lady True mm. and how they're both reflections, whether where they're all kind of reflections of their parents yeah. and their family. Yeah. And, and, and this, it, it stems from that background and, and, and what that means. And I think that's so powerful because the older I become, RB3, the more I realize like, oh my God, I'm turning into, I'm turning into my dad, I'm turning into my parents. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of that is like my Mexican anger that comes out and I'm like, crap, I'm my dad. Yeah. Uh, and then I start to realize like it really does, it's true, like it really is true. Mm-hmm. A lot of people start to reflect their parents yeah. and reflect their background. Mm-hmm where they come from is really important mm. and, and how that can be good and how that can be bad. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to become your parents, but it means that you still have that in you no matter what. It's inside your your, your blood. Yeah. And what you choose to do with it is the important part. Yeah, I mean, that, that quite literally comes down to um, career paths too, right? Like all of Angela's family end up serving at one form that's another, right in law enforcement law right? enforcement and that's very true i mean you talk to people who are in law enforcement now it's always a thing of like oh my dad was a law enforcement his grandfather was my, my my dad's dad was in law enforcement like it's always a generational thing because that's just what you inherit right you inherit your parents being and it's the difference between good parents and bad parents or whether or not you're going to have a good uh well active a human being in society or whether you're not. Um, obviously, Az- Ozymandias did not have, like, the best of parenthoods. Lori Blake did not have the best of parenthoods. Um, 
all of these characters who we deal with in the original Watchmen are deeply, deeply broken people. Um, and this show approaches that as well. I mean, clearly we see Angela lose her parents from the very beginning. And then right when her grandma comes to pick her up, her last family member who she knows, her grandma comes to pick her up, she literally dies, like, in the, like what, like 10 minutes later. So it's like this idea of, like, constant loss, right? The idea of, like, having... Of, 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 of having all of these people and all of these things that you come to know as when you're a kid just all taken away from you, what does that do traumatically, right? Like, how does Lori cope with the idea that the comedian was her father this entire time? Well, she picks up a gun and she starts hunting down superheroes. Um, how does Angela Abar deal with the, the fact that um, her parents uh, died or got exploded um, at this at this uh, you know in Vietnam in yeah. Vietnam she joins the military she lives in Vietnam she continues to be in Vietnam she becomes a law enforcement officer in Vietnam and eventually in America um, so it just all goes to play on the bigger deeper themes of like yeah this is where characters are eventually going to end up progressing as a result of their legacy as a result of their parentage yeah I'm, I mean the more on a personal level and, and I don't know it's up to you if you want to take it on a personal level mm. but I always do um, just hearing stories from my family for example and learning where I come from and who my grandfather was mm. who, who who my father was and who my mother was mm. and, and her stories of, of just getting to to this country mm. for example um, always kind of bring a different weight for me uh, and always kind of remind me of like what my legacy is and what my family is and where I come from, for example, because I am first generation. So that it means something different to me and and kind of carrying on that 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 name. And, and I know it's just a last name, but it's a name that it's, it's a family name for a reason because it stays with you. Mm. Um, so it's a, it's an interesting reminder how the show does it with the characters of True and Blake and Angela as far as carrying on the name. Uh, so I, I just find that fascinating because I really do feel like legacies and and and, and all that kind of stuff, family trees and generations yeah. is, is something that I've always found to be really fascinating. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's move on to th- another aspect of the show that I felt like says a lot, well, even though it's only in it for a couple minutes right. each episode, mm-hmm. and that's the show within the show. Yeah, Let's talk about the Minutemen show. Mm-hmm. Uh, throughout the entire series, uh, the, the season of Watchmen, we see a show called Minuteman, yeah. which is supposed to be this expose narrative, uh, semi-doc, semi-real mm. uh, story retelling of the original Minuteman. Mm. And it's like the People versus OJ, like it the is. American Crime Story. There yeah, you go. Yeah, there yeah. you go. And and it's really, I think it says a lot. I think mm. it says a lot about American culture, about the way we view uh, our past, the way we we we. We glorify, F- glorify, fantasize things. about it yeah. in, in, in the way it's actually true, what is true and what isn't, and the way we choose to show it yeah. to people is really fascinating. What do you think about the, the Minutemen show inside the show? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, like like pretty much everything you already touched on, it, it, it does uh, present like a commentary on like um, American media um, in particular. And, you know, I... I think they were taking direct dunks at like Zack Snyder, <laughs> if I'm being completely honest. Cause yeah, there a lot of Zack I could Snyder. see some of it, but but yeah. when you listen to Damon, he seems to like the the Zack Snyder film quite you gotta, a bit. You got to point me to where to where that to where that is, because I, I mean I didn't. I have to. I want to. I want to I wanna hear that. Yeah, I, I mean, he, hear, I love to hear anybody talk positively about Zack Snyder. Yeah, I know. I, I I'll show you. Yeah, I'll yeah, show yeah. you for real. It might. Um, I don't think it's on his podcast. I think it was on another it was one. On I another one. To. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I um, I but I think moreover, I think. Again, I reference um, I reference American Crime Story, the OJ series, right? The idea of like having an actual murder, like OJ Simpson, and shit. If you ask most people now, they say OJ is a hero. You know what I mean? Or not a hero per se, but if you talk to a lot of people now, people it's, it's more of a joking kind of thing, right? And that show, um, as great as it is, it is kind of this exploitative look at that case and that trial. Um, it, it it takes everything just slightly heightened, and I think in this, you know, especially in, in this this show within the show, it, it adds a definitely heightened perspective to the to the actual events or well, the fictional events in the in the context of the Watchmen series of what happens to uh, Hood of Justice. Like I, I think one of the one of the striking moments for me that I love is seeing in the and I think it's 
episode three or episode four where there's a fight scene that happens in a grocery store mm. um, that is portrayed in a TV show and you see the bad guy being thrown out the window and everything like that. But then when you see the actual event happen in episode six, it's actually Hood of Justice himself that's being thrown, thrown out the window. And he was fighting the grocery store owner. Yeah, yeah, not exactly. saving him. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly, exactly. Um, but it goes to show like how there's this kind of glorification, this hero worship thing that you, you has to revise the story to be more, you know, quote unquote cinematic or more heroic or something like that. So it's it, it, it touches deep onto those themes. And um, again, another parallel to the graphic novel, the graphic novel has the Black Freighter yeah. story. That's the comic within the comic. And that story is also the idea of like this glorification of this hero who's making the ultimate sacrifice um, in exchange for the greater good. Um, hence, who Ozymandias takes influence from directly. Yeah, so. interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah. Let, let, let's kind of go back to, to Hood of Justice and, and the idea of, like, the supervillain in the show is Cyclops. Right. What do you think of the whole Cyclops angle of, like, creating black-on-black uh, uh, -black violence and outrage and that kind of idea that, that happens mm. in episode six? I think that's very, that's very deep. I mean, that's literally something that... I mean, that's something that um, a lot of uh, black fiction writers have been dealing with a lot in recent in recent literature and in movies. I mean the idea the same thing as get out, same thing as a lot of the um a lot of modern text is happening. The idea of like what if and it's an extension of the truth, the idea of like black on black violence isn't something that's necessarily uh at fault of black people in and of ourselves. Like that's not that's not the case. It's the institutions that has been surrounding us this entire time. The environment that that uh, and the discrimination that we faced our entire lives, we're just re it, it becomes recontextualized within our own community where violence is enacted in, uh, on on each other. Um, it's that same rage and anger that uh, that is caused by generational trauma that is influencing these events. And I think more I think more directly to the point of what the show's getting at is also the media too, right? The idea of only. It, you know, the show shows that this black and black violence is happening in a movie theater through a projector, right? Because these people are watching these images on screen and they're reenacting them. Um, that's what I think that's a big contributor to black and black violence, too. The, the whole if you, if you watch any movie, any kind of gangster movie, any kind of training day or anything like that. It's all about black people going at other black people, black people shooting other black people. Um, instead of fighting the actual matter at hand, the actual racism at hand, but it's the racist institutions that's put that's portraying us that way to begin with. Um, so it, I, I think, the show does a brilliant job of getting this overall message of yeah, movies, media throughout the entire history of cinema have been brainwashing people, um, black people to do black on black violence, but more importantly, it has, it has. It has portrayed black on black violence on screen enough to the point of where white people think that's the common that's the most common denominator that's what that's what's normal and that's what's average uh, inciting further hate and how movies in and of themselves have done nothing but to incite hate throughout the entire throughout most of the history of cinema yeah it, it really is fascinating which is if i'm being honest I, I really do think that's a powerful medium especially something like film and movies yeah, 100%. it does have an influence and i really feel like it does and, and spike spike lee's uh black clansman do, touches on that whole thing centrally right with the whole scene where they're talking about and watching birth of a nation that's right how that is literally considered one of the early pieces of cinema that's right uh and and it was inducted into the White House and everything like that, but it has, but it's literally about the KKK. The KKK. Yeah. How there's never been, and salute to this show for having a silent film that portrays, a, a fictional silent film that portrays like this black hero. You know, during that time period, it, it's, it's tough to determine if that could have existed or not because we did lose like 90% of silent films, but for the most part, for to our historical record now, we don't see movies like that back in that time period. Everything that was pretty much pre nineteen sixties was or pre nineteen seventies really, um, even during the seventies a little bit was almost entirely anti black. Yeah. Um. So, it, it, you know, because of how much anti blackness we have inducted into our media, it go, it plays directly into the the violence that black people have been suffering this entire. Throughout, throughout generations and upon generations. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's the idea of of how racism and the KKK has used 
uh, almost film as a weapon with Birth of a Nation. I, I'm glad you mentioned that because Damon mentions it in, in the podcast. Mm. Uh, in episode two of the podcast, he talks about how like this is the portrayal that we've seen and, and the power of Birth of a Nation during that time period. And, and they show it in Black Klansman was so powerful because it, it, it incited more anger and it incited more excitement mm. for this movement against the the black minority and and it really is a, an interesting perspective of the the way film can be used as a weapon yeah um and it's really powerful it's a really mm-hmm. powerful weapon and people who have that agenda of racist ideology use that as a weapon and they're very they have the resources to make that a weapon because they have different things that go for them mm-hmm. that that other people might not have the opportunity for yeah. so they use that as a weapon because they have the money and they can make it um, which is such a scary image if you think about it because you're like, wow, I mean, how can I stop that, right? right? Which is why I feel like giving filmmaking opportunities to other people is so crucial in my mind. It's like an actual thing I, I worry about because I want to see the same tools being given to everyone and not just the select 1% that right. we see nowadays, right. which it usually still is if I'm being real. I mean, honestly, man, like just even look at the nominees for – for Oscars, like mm. for crying out loud, like it's the same white dudes we've been seeing for like the past 20 years. No yeah. offense. They make great movies, but Jesus yeah. Christ. <laughs> Especially in the year that it's we've It's ridiculous. Had. Especially <laughs> in recent years where we've had this, um, such a, a an eclipse of like great black cinema. Yeah. Uh, especially in something like 2018. That's what I'm uh, saying. Like, like it really is years, like we've had great cinema. When you really I, I just the more I read about film and the more I, I see it, the more I'm like, wow, this really is like just a ton of white dudes. Uh, but anyways, kind of going off that. And speaking of white dudes, I, I really the last thing I'll say and, I, and I'll leave the floor to you to kind of mm. put the button on the podcast. Oh, yeah. I want to talk about um Looking Glass. Yeah. Uh, Looking Glass is a character that I, I wanted to look up. I believe his name is Wade in the show. Mm. I think he's such a crucial character. I really do. Yeah. Um, and the reason why is because I feel like episode five, I think it's five. Mm. Yeah, episode, episode five. Episode five, where yeah. they try to recruit him, mm. uh, the the Seventh Calvary. Yeah. It's such an interesting episode because it's that idea of like, here's a guy who has everything, all the tools and all the background you need to to be recruited into into the Seventh Cavalry. Right. He he's a white guy, lived all his life in Oklahoma, like super southern, super white, lived through trauma. Like this is a guy who's like, let's get him riled up mm-hmm. uh, for our cause, our our racist cause. And and the way that Senator Keene chooses to target him as like his super secret weapon mm-hmm. to say, this is our guy. This is the guy we're going to get to join our cause and to switch sides because he's an angry white guy. And the fact that the plan doesn't work, RB3, mm-hmm. like it just, he he didn't go for it. Even though the whole truth gets revealed to him, even though he's supposed to feel angry against the people who did this to him, mm-hmm. he just doesn't. He chooses not to. Mm-hmm. And he chooses to 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 help Lori and to help Angela, right. regardless of of everything he's been told to believe. Right. I, I just found that to be so it's so crucial in my opinion because I really do feel like that's that opportunity to say, hey, these same Southern people that a lot of people villainize in the media are our allies. I was like gonna, I was going to say that exact same thing. It, they're it, our allies, yeah. and, and and I think Wade plays that character so well because I'm like, there's that country country dude who's like, yeah, dude, like I want you on my team, bro. Like mm. I I see you, yeah. like I, I I like that that Watchman is doing it with the character and the fact that the Seventh Cavalry tries to recruit him and be like, bro, you're supposed to be angry at these people. You're just yeah. you want justice, and he's like, no, not. Not really. No, I don't. What you're doing is wrong, and it's evil, and you're yeah. just inciting violence. And more, 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 moreover, the actual racists are the politicians, right? Mm-hmm. Joe Keene, who we know throughout the entire Watchmen uh, comic book, he's the one who enacts the Keene Act, which, uh, which, uh, this, which takes away the idea of superheroes and puts cops in charge, right? And then his uh, grands, I think, is his grandson who is. Uh, who is the, the new politician, mm-hmm. uh, um, and he is the hyper racist the entire time. And and how you could be racist but still cut your hair really nice, be young, and wear a nice suit, and still have this and say all the right things, and say all the right things, and get elected into office. And um, 
and actually be the, the secret races behind it all. Because when you really think about it, and, and I, that's what I loved about episode nine is when you actually meet all of the people who are responsible for this, it is just a bunch of old dudes. It's the old, like... So true. Yeah, literally. It really like, is true. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and those old guys are just harboring their d- fucking 1920 beliefs onto their kids, and they're just harping away at the same things too. So it just goes to show that, yeah, this is uh, an institutional problem. This isn't something that is to be dealt with um, on the level of like just surface level um, kind of change. This is something that requires an, a complete overthrow of like what establishments and institutions have been running things to begin with. Because I, I mean, when you I mean, l- you literally look at things like the Constitution and and think that there was none of that stuff was written with the intent of black people or slaves in mind at all. They're inherently racist. The entire idea of America is imperialism, is colonialism, is t- taking um, African slaves, putting them on a boat, and shipping them all the way across the country for your own self-satisfaction and your own grandizement. Like, that's the entire story of America. So that is, 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 is great portraying that side of the United States as the politician side of it, as opposed to the regular people side of it, who there are a lot of good stuff. And granted, there are a lot of Southern people who do look like Wade, who are terrible people. Yeah. But there are there are people who are actually have compassion, do have do have a heart like like looking glass. Like and that's why I, yeah. I feel like he's such a crucial character because of that angle, because of this idea of like. Yeah. And his and his trauma is so much different than everybody else's trauma. Yeah. To where his trauma, he actually sees fault more in the squid. He's actually more angry about that aspect of his life instead of actually being focused on his own disenfranchisement and blaming it on black people, which mm-hmm. most races do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I just feel like the, the the way they handle that character is so interesting because I was like, oh, here's this country white dude who's trying to be recruited into the KKK. Yeah. And he's just, it doesn't work. He says yeah. no. And he yeah. fights back against them. And right. he kills them all. Um, and, and that's why I was like, that's such a crucial character. Because I feel like it's important to to show that, you know, mm-hmm. these are our allies. And these are our friends just as much. Yeah. Um, any final words, man, on Watchmen HBO before we close up? Um, yeah, this is uh, the show to decade. We, obviously, we didn't talk about Dr. Manhattan that much. The, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot to there's a lot to talk about. Dr. I mean, you could literally do a whole episode on Dr. Yeah, Manhattan. I was going to say the whole God idea, the idea of creation. Yeah. The idea of what you're be, be being created for. Um, and looks, even, but, the, even the idea of this, even the idea in this show that, like, Dr. Manhattan is also wearing a mask and of himself, yeah. too. He's changed himself from this, over, you know, white dude or blue dude into wearing the skin of a black man and having and having that be his disguise and having that be his way of uh, masking trauma. He, he's masking his trauma so much so that he has Angela put a thing in his head to where he just doesn't, the word to, he'll just float for the, for the next 10 years uh, of his life. Let, let's finish up on that episode. God walks into a bar. Yeah. Um, what'd you think of that? That's probably my favorite. That's really? That's probably my favorite. Se- favorite and it's all favorite. exposition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. And it's your favorite? Well, it's... It's, it's literally all exposition. But, no, but it, it embraces the Dr. Manhattan way of storytelling, right? Like yeah. Like the, the whole broken structure, time, non-linear kind of thing. And they did a really smart and creative way of incorporating all of that. Like, as it is exposition, it is also... That that's the character of Doctor Manhattan. Doctor Manhattan is exposition. That's true. In a graphic novel, I mean, he literally he is just, just says shit. novels. Yeah, literally, <laughs> like, he has entire yeah. pages of, of text, and uh, and I, you know, you come to expect that. Um, but I love that episode because a it plays with the idea of time, right? The idea of time and mm. and, tem- and um and editing and temper and uh, temporal is that how you pronounce it? Whatever. Um, like alignment, and everything like that. Um, I love that plays with that, but I also love the idea of like this kind of like cosmic love story that's happening. Mm. This, un, this undeniable fate that is called from the very beginning, but still plays, still finds its way to play out. Yeah, the so. fact that you're willing to do something even though you're told it'll end in tragedy because you're so in love with it mm-hmm. that at the end of the day you're convinced that you will stop the tragedy, that right. you can twist fate and you can change the future, mm-hmm. so to say, right. to keep what you love close to you, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's that idea of, like, love conquers all, therefore my love will conquer the future that you said I will have, right? Right. right. Which, is so, which is so fascinating. And I love that when he says that this is the moment, 
because he says, you know, there's a moment and he says, you know, I experience moments all the time. Right. But at the end of the season, he says, this is the moment when she's grabbing all the guns. Yeah, I fell in love with you. Yeah. yeah, yeah and he's yeah. like, no, this is the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought that was so good because it, sh- it, sh- it shows like a tiny bit of like Dr. Manhattan being like, oh, yeah, I, I know what you mean now. Uh-huh. I didn't get it before, but I get it now. Right. Uh, even though he ex- experiences it all the time. Right. It's really, really fascinating stuff, and and I just like that. I, I like his little background story and the way he 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 views um, humanity and the way he read the Bible, and and it, and it kind of inspired him right. <laughs> to be God, yeah. which I find funny. He's like, oh, whoa, what if I become the God that they talk about? Mm-hmm. Um, and he made his little planet in Jupiter, yeah. one of the moons of Jupiter. I forget the moon. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I just thought like that was such an interesting Europa. Uh, Europa, there you go. Uh, idea of what happens to Doctor Manhattan after the novel. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, no, I you think go. you know, and, and what's sad about Doctor Manhattan is, unfortunately, he became one of the most exploited characters. He's the, pretty much the only exploited character out of the Watchmen series now. I don't know if you've been keeping up, but there's this whole thing in DC where it's like, yeah, Doctor Manhattan versus Superman, the Doomsday and, Clock, yeah, the Doomsday yeah. Clock thing, and. I mean that that that's kind of sad. <laughs> I mean that yeah. that makes me sad a little bit. But I like the way they did it in this show, and I like the way that I think to me the way I kind of rank the series. The first three episodes are the Angela Abar story. The second three episodes are the Will Reed story, and then the last three story last three episodes are the Doctor Manhattan story, right? And um and from an almost religious eye, how Doctor Manhattan plays a part, even though he only really shows up at the very end, but he really shows up at the very beginning. From the whole Vietnam Vietcom explosion thingy, um, but I, I I like the fact that the show is limited in the way it uses them. Um, but I also think there's still a lot of storytelling that could have been that could have potentially been had with Doctor Manhattan. I'm sure. So absolutely. I mean, that it's, it bums me out a little bit that there's not a season two. I'm gonna be a little really? honest because there's still a lot of story I think they can mine. Yeah. And I would be behest to say that even though I think this is probably one of the shows of the decade, and even in 2019, even. I loved a lot of movies, but this is my favorite thing in 2019. I do think, like, the finale was probably the my least favorite episode of the entire show. Yeah. I think they could have, you know, it didn't hit as strong as I thought it was going to hit. I think they still have plenty of opportunities to keep it going if they really wanted to. But. Yeah, I mean, it, it's tough. I mean, it's tough to make a finale to that show. It really is because yeah. I, I felt like every episode was perfect. Yeah. I was blown away. If I'm being real, like I was blown away by every episode. Yeah. Everything did something different, and I was just like, "Oh my god, that's my favorite!" Oh my god, that's my favorite now. Yeah. Um, and and the way they explored so many themes and just flipping the idea of superheroes on its head mm-hmm. was just so cool to me. I, I enjoyed the finale, but I I do agree that it's probably. I don't think it's bad. I just think it's, no, it's probably, not bad. It's no, just no. probably the weakest. Well, that's that's the thing. When you make eight mind blowing episodes, it's tough to make a, a finale that's going to be as yeah. mind blowing as people expect. I just think the whole season is mind blowing. Yeah. If yeah, I had to sure. rate it as a season, to me, I was like, man, I'm blown away. Yeah. Just really interesting stuff and mm. really cool. We never figured out what happened to Lube Guy. We never figured out that. Story yeah, I think that's Petey. I think most people think it's Petey. Yeah. You don't think it's Petey? Oh, the actual. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it could be. Sure. Yeah. I, I'd love to see that explore it somewhere for sure. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, we won't get it. Uh, I enjoyed the Watchmen HBO show, and I enjoyed yeah. Watchmen as a whole. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, shout out to Zack Snyder. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Zack Snyder. Shout out to Alan Moore. Yeah. Shout out to uh, Dave Gibbons who did the art, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, um, you know what? I, I'm gonna give a shout out to. I know I don't know their names, the directors and the writers of this show. Yeah, Nicole Nicole Kelson. Yeah, she I think just won a DGA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For for, for best uh, TV episode. For Watchmen. Yeah. Oh, it suits her. Yeah. Yeah, she, she just won that DGA for best TV episode. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. All of the directors and writers and Damian Lindelof and all of the, all those people. Um, throughout the three, uh, I I recommend anyone. Obviously, you've seen the show if you're watching this podcast because we spoiled yeah, I hope it. So, yeah. Um, I recommend if you haven't, go check out the Damian Lindelof. Off HBO Watchmen podcast. Yeah. Uh, literally, just type in Watchmen podcast and it will come out. Um, he talks about something that I want to give my final shout out to, and he said the importance of a diverse writers' room. Mm-hmm. And he said, "Here, here's Damon Lindelof." And I wanted to ask you, I forgot to. Mm-hmm. What do you think about him telling this story? Because it, a lot of conversation is is always had about like who's allowed to say certain stories right. and to talk about certain things, right. uh, and the fact that he was the one, but he always went out of his way throughout this podcast to talk about that right. and to say, I surrounded myself with a writer's room filled with women 
mm. filled with 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 African American women and African American men mm. telling me, but he, he went out of his way to say women, yeah. but telling me what is there, what isn't there, right. and, and really listening. Mm-hmm. And I think that's so important. And I, and I talked about it uh, with, with Ken on the uh, Casterly talk about Game of Thrones right. and how it would have helped to have probably a little bit more women there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah I know yeah. you haven't seen Game of Thrones, but there's Game some stuff Thrones. there that I'm like, ah, if there's a lady in there, she would have been like, nah, bro. Yeah. Um, um, it really helps. It really does help. And I know a lot of people, again, roll their eyes and say that's not true, whatever. Mm. Having that diverse ideas, mm. thoughts, mm-hmm. uh, writing, conversation really does help and it can create a show like this. So yeah, that's, that's my final shout out is to yeah. Damon for that. Yeah, and yeah, that no, writer's 100%. Room. Yeah. There you go. All right, guys, hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Give us a like, a comment, uh, follow us on social media at First Cut TMO. You can follow me at Squad Leader Ace. Follow me at Director RB3. And for the Meaning of Podcast, I am Andres. This is RB3. And we are peacing out. Peace out, guys. Peace out.